so we will begin our um, epistle to the Philippians. Um, Philippians is a rather frightening uh, book for me uh, personally, uh, because the Philippians were amazing believers. They were such spiritual giants. You know, when uh, we look at, for instance, okay, when, when I look at uh, Corinthians, the letters to the Corinthians, I look at them and I look at the mistakes they did. And I think, ah, see, I, I know better than them. You know, I'm better off than these people. But when I'm looking at these Philippian believers and you know, and what Paul says about them over here in this epistle, I'm like, wow, when, when on earth, Lord, will I reach that level where I can be like them? You know, so they are an amazing people. Uh, you know, uh, the kind of words that Paul uses when he's talking about them, um, he really, I think, had great respect for them. Uh, so um, uh, the Philip, the epistle to the Philippians is a very inspiring uh, uh, book, and um, uh, we'll you know we'll try to touch upon at least the main the main key points that are there uh, in the first two chapters. So just for us to kind of get a brief background, um, how exactly did this Philippian church even begin? Uh, for us to find out, you know, uh, to, for us to know that, uh, we would have to go to Acts chapter sixteen where you have the background story mentioned very briefly. So in Acts chapter 16, uh, verse 6 onwards, you know, if we were to see, uh, we, we learn that Paul and his companions, you know, they set out on their uh, missionary journey. And their idea is basically to go to Asia Minor and, you know, share the gospel over there. So they're heading over there towards Asia Minor. And then the Lord uh, does not permit it. He, he does not want them to go over there. That's not the correct time for them to go there. So then they think, OK, fine. Uh, maybe we should go towards Baithinia. So they move away and uh, they change direction. And they start going towards Baithinia. But again, the spirit of uh, the Lord, it says over here, the spirit of Jesus would not allow them to go there. And so now they, you know, they instead head towards Troas. And uh, Paul is kind of wondering, you know, what is it that the Lord wants us to do? Where are we meant to go? And he gets this dream at that time. And uh, so in his dream, uh, or OK, a vision. In his vision, he sees a man of Macedonia standing over there and begging and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. So that is the background. So based on this uh, vision that has been given to him by the Lord, Paul and his uh, you know, team, they set out uh, towards uh, Macedonia where you basically have Philippi uh, and, and all, of, all of these other cities. So they, they come over here. And so here in Philippi, uh, on the Sabbath day, you know, uh, they know that generally on the Sabbath day, you know, outside the city, uh, people gather for prayer. Um, so they go on the Sabbath day outside the city gate. And they see this uh, group of women who have gathered together for prayer. So they sit down among them and start sharing the gospel with them. And uh, Lydia, who is uh, quite a wealthy uh, merchant um, dealing in purple cloth. Um, so um, she's a purple cloth dealer. And uh, so uh, she uh, you know, shows a lot of um, um, you know, eager, eagerness regarding the gospel. And uh, because it says over here, the Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. So she and the other people who are there with her, they all choose to accept uh, you know, the gospel which is being shared. And in fact, it says in verse 15 over there, you know, Acts chapter 16, verse 15, it says that um, they all you know, get baptized. Uh, so right there on that day, they make their commitment you know, to become followers of the Lord. And that is basically how the Philippian church begins. Um, it, it begins with people who have open, receptive hearts to what the Lord is sharing and putting in their hearts. And from that moment on, there's no looking back. Uh, they seem to have been quite a committed you know, group of Christians. So coming to chapter 1, uh, you know, a book of um, um, epistle to the Philippians, um, Maybe we could have someone read out Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 to 7. If someone could please read out for us uh, Philippians uh, chapter 1, verses 3 to 7. Yeah. Can you read this? Yeah. 
I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making my prayer with joy, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I'm sure of this, that he who begin a good work in you will bring it to the completion of the day of Jesus Christ. It was, It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. Yeah, so uh, he says that I always pray with joy uh, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Okay, so um, whenever he's praying for this particular church, he feels joy because he has seen the way they have just accepted, embraced the gospel and how they are really living it out in their lives. Uh, so he says right from the first day, you know, when Lydia says, you know, please come home, you know, so after the baptism, uh, it says in, in Acts chapter 16, she, you know, invites them. She, she, it says over there that she persuades them uh, to come to her house. And so that's how the church begins, you know, in that place. So he says over here, Paul says over here, uh, you know, right from the first day until now, you have been actively partnering with me in sharing the gospel. Um, and uh, so he says, you know, um, he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. What is the day of Christ Jesus? You know, that would be the uh, second coming when Jesus Christ comes back as Lord and sovereign over all. And uh, so, you know, his rule and reign would begin. And that is the time when he will uh, honor those who have been faithful to him. He will give them their rewards. So here, you know, Paul is saying, uh, because you have been so open to the work of the Lord, uh, you know, because you've been so open to whatever God is trying to teach you in your hearts, and you have been fully involved, you know, in fulfilling the Great Commission. Because you of your openness, God will continue the good work which, you know, which he began in you. Because you are open towards that good work. You are receptive. You are willing to cooperate with him in, you know, in furthering this good work which is being done inside your hearts. And so he says, on that day, you know, the, until the day of Christ Jesus. So you will uh, be able to, um, you know, accomplish and fulfill all of God's purposes for your lives. And on that day of Christ Jesus, you know, you would receive your reward. Uh, so he talks about how they have partnered with him in the gospel. And in verse 7, he also says, all of you share in God's grace with me. Uh, you know, if you remember when we were doing, um, was it Ephesians? When we were doing Ephesians, we were talking about how uh, the term grace is used in four different ways. And one of the ways in which the word grace is used, uh, it's talking about the giftings that God gives to all of us as a church. You know, the grace giftings that uh, God gives us, um, you know, which is the gifting of apostleship, the gifting of hospitality, uh, the gifting of prophecy and all of these giftings. You know, so, uh, so uh, here he's, he is, you know, referring to the way they have... Um, been active in ministry along with him. Now, see, these are not uh, full-time ministers. Most of them are just church members. Of course, there would be leaders among them, uh, but most of them are just lay people, but they have been very active in ministry. So here is one church that has actually caught the, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the truth about uh, why spiritual giftings are given and how they should be used. So uh, when we were doing Ephesians, we talked about that. We talked about how the fivefold ministry giftings have been given to certain people so that they can equip the rest of the other people you know, uh, to do the work of ministry. Because the actual ministry giftings as such you know, have been given to the entire body of Christ, to all the believers. All the believers are the ones who are supposed to be fully engaged in doing ministry work wherever they are, you know, in their office places, uh, in, the, in their uh, neighborhoods, among their own you know, fa family circles. So um, the, uh, the entire work of ministry is actually meant to be done by the believers, um, by, the, by, the, by the body of Christ. These fivefold ministry leaders, what do they do? 
depending on the gifting that they have been given you know they operate in that they do whatever you know they have uh, been blessed and anointed to do you know uh, for instance an apostle will will go about uh, planting churches but that apostle's responsibility is also to equip the other believers for ministry so all the others you know in the church who have been given this gifting to be able to start off new uh, groups of believers he would in fact train them teach them give them practical tips on how you know in their office you know how to start up a small prayer group you know in in their office and from that you know that will grow into a body of believers so he is supposed to train them to operate as apostles at their level you know i mean they would not not go around uh, you know in the place with the title of apostle because you know they are in the you know in the, in the secular uh, marketplace but in their own spheres spheres of influence they have been given this beautiful gifting to be able to start off small groups of fellowship so they they so they actually have this gifting of apostleship in them and most of them are clueless on how to go about exercising their gifting so it is this fivefold ministers it is their responsibility to teach the people how to move in that gifting which has been given to them you know i was just um, speaking to this uh, person last month uh, who has such a burden for people who are um, who are who are you know uh, demonized and uh, who are you know uh, uh, struggling with with strongholds because satan has bound them and she has such a burden for them and she wants to minister among them and she was saying i have i have no clue how to do a deliverance ministry i mean i can feel such a burden in my heart and such a leading in my heart to, to reach out and do something for them but i have no clue what to do and how to do it uh, so you see people who are maybe anointed and equipped in that uh, thing you know in that particular gifting they should be the ones who will train up the lay believers who are hungry and eager to do the, the that thing that whatever ministry that you know that god has been pressing upon their heart so who's going to equip them who's going to train them who's going to show them how it is done so the people in this fivefold um, ministry leadership they are the ones who are supposed to move in their gifting you know on a on, on like on a 24 hour basis because they're called to you know a full time um, posting so uh, they're supposed to really move in this gifting and demonstrate to the rest of the believers how they can use that same gifting you know if god has given that to them so a teacher it's it's uh, his responsibility to to train up other people who have that gifting and tell them see this is how you can actually teach and explain the the gospel in your bible study you know or, or, or when you're having your family devotions you know this is how you can make it simple and explain to your family from the scriptures so it it becomes the responsibility of the fivefold ministry leaders to equip different people in their church in the giftings that have been given to them so that they can go out and do the ministry that they are meant to so many many um um church leaders don't understand this they think that they are supposed to be doing all the ministry work and that the congregation is supposed to stand on the sidelines and clap for them no the church the body of christ has been richly uh, gifted with a whole bunch of giftings and they are in fact many of them are hungry and eager to get involved to do something you know uh, in the places uh, wherever they are working and wherever they are, have their contacts but many of them are clueless because the leaders have not bothered training them showing them uh, how to use those giftings that they have so here it looks like in this philippian church you know paul and uh, timothy and the other leaders had actually taken the effort to train them show them how they can partner in the gospel and so here are these people who are literally sharing in god's grace with me he says so you know he says in verse 7 all of you share in god's grace with me and they are actually using this grace gifts that have been given to them to really do the work of ministry so in fact um when people are actively involved in you know in ministering in trying to serve in trying to share the gospel with people in in you know in building them up in the lord when they are doing that 
it becomes easier for them in their own spiritual walk you see because they have to continuously keep going to the lord and saying lord how how do i minister to this person what do i say it increases their own dependency on god it increases their own walk with god so the reason a lot of our congregations i know uh, are so i mean uh, um, uh, indifferent sometimes is because they feel what is there for me to do all i need to do is go there on sunday lift up my hands and worship the lord and i'm done i mean that's my role you know the actual work of ministry will anyway be done by those leaders but no there are giftings which have been put inside that believer and that and god has a purpose for their lives you know so uh, for if, if if someone would tell them see i i recognize these giftings in you you know i i want to help you to develop them i want to start equipping you are you eager i'm sure a lot of them would be like more than ready to uh, to you know uh, start doing something for the lord because they all have that hunger inside to do something for him so they just need someone who will take the effort to equip and train them you know in their own areas so an apostle will teach others how to start you know small uh, you know believer groups uh, a, a prophet will will will, will teach uh, the people who have that particular gifting how they can use their gifting to speak words of encouragement into people's lives you know uh, very accurately in their time of need god would give them the exact word maybe or the, or the exact scripture which they can share with someone and really you know become that dream uh, uh, cause it to become that rema word for them for that particular occasion so these are things giftings which are there in the believers and it is the responsibility of the leaders to equip people to move in those giftings so that the work of ministry gets done effectively powerfully and on the scale that it should be done the reason that a lot of the of our countries are not yet reached with the gospel is because only the leaders are trying to do it the congregation is not even aware that they are supposed to be participating in this great commission so um, it uh, and and they, uh, most of them don't even know that they have all these giftings in them uh, you know so uh i think it's a very it's something that god will hold the leaders responsible for so you know i mean uh, those of us who are doing this course among you you know if any of you are holding that five fold ministry giftings then know that you have the responsibility of course in moving in your gifting and doing all that you can for the kingdom of god but you also have a god given responsibility of equipping the other believers you know if you recognize that same gifting which you have in the other people who are there uh, in your church then go to them and point out to them and see i i can clearly see the, this gifting in you can i help you can i equip you you know can i guide you in moving in this gifting so that you too can start using this gifting wherever you go in that way the gospel would spread much faster and a lot more would be achieved and the lord would be very happy because his entire body is actively engaged in fulfilling his purposes you know rather than just having a minor percentage doing the work of god everyone would be engaged in that and so throughout this um, you know letter to the philippians again and again he touches upon this aspect of how they are actively partnering with him you know in 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 doing the gospel work again and again he keeps bringing up this whole idea of how they are um partnering with him in the work of ministry so i thought maybe we, you know we could uh, you know spend a little time talking about this particular aspect because it is so important uh, uh, and that is how a healthy church grows that is how a church stays eager and enthusiastic about the things of god because all are equally you know busily engaged in you know in in the work of god um then coming to uh, verse 12 um okay uh, verses 12 to 24 you know we could maybe see it as one large chunk um so over here uh, you know in verse 12 paul says you know he's basically referring to the fact that the philippians are feeling very sad uh, that you know he's uh, imprisoned in rome and that uh, th things are you know kind of difficult for him over there so he says over uh, to them you know he speaks assurance in verse 12 and he says uh, what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel no so because he says now everybody over here in the palace and and and, and you know um, a lot of people are talking about me they are talking about the strange man 
who has got imprisoned not because he's done any criminal activity or anything, but because he's talking about this Jesus Christ. And the Jews are very, very angry that he's talking about Jesus Christ. And that is the, that is the reason why he is imprisoned over here. So people are talking about this. So they're, you know, they're probably asking questions. Who is this Jesus Christ? Why is this man willing to get imprisoned for the sake of this Jesus? So in that way, a lot of publicity has happened. And uh, as a result of that publicity, the gospel is getting known. People are talking about the gospel. And that makes uh, Paul very happy. And uh, so, you know, he says, um, uh, maybe we could, uh, so if we could have someone read out um, verses 15 to 18. Yeah, if someone could please read out Philippians 1, uh, 1 15 to 18. Okay. Can you hear me? Uh, it, it, it is uh, verses 15 to 18, please. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm not able to hear. You can't hear me. See? Oh, I can hear you now. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Some in this pretest even from end and life, and some also mm. from good will. The former preach Christ selfishly, not sincerely, supposed to add affliction to my chains, but they let out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the sins of the gospel, for the only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth. Is preached and in this rejoice, yes, and will rejoice, amen. Yeah, yeah. So we see that Paul is very happy that he got imprisoned because it's leading to a lot of good publicity for the gospel. He's very happy with people who are preaching with all the wrong motives. They are preaching not because they love the Lord and because they want people to be saved, they are preaching, you know, to promote themselves. Uh, to, uh, to to become famous, to become rich. They're doing it with all the wrong motives. Even that also he's happy with. Why? Because he says it doesn't matter. Even, even though they're doing it with wrong motives, you know, the gospel is getting preached. People are getting to know about Jesus Christ, about what he has done. So uh, we see such a passion in this man for the gospel of Christ. And he goes on to, you know, talk about this further um, in verses 22 to 25. You know, he says um, uh, he's talking about how he doesn't he doesn't at that point of time. He's still not very sure whether he will be, he will be set free or whether he would get a death sentence. So he's a little unclear on that. And it's like thinking, you know, which would be better, uh, you know, getting a death sentence and then, you know, dying and then going to be with Jesus Christ. Or should I continue to stay over here because I'm needed over here? You know, the work is going on and I still have a lot uh, to contribute, you know, towards the gospel, so the, the ministry. And so he says over here in verse 22, he says, yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two, he says, because he says, I would really like to go and be with Christ, you know, so it would be nice, you know, if I'm given a death sentence. But he says in verse 24, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. And so he says in verse 25, I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. So he says, no, no, no. It would be nice, of course, to go away and be with Christ. But then if I am continue to be over here, you know, I can continue to mentor you. I can continue to teach you. Uh, and then, I, you know, you will be able to grow further in the Lord. So I think maybe it would be better for me to continue over here. So if you look at the, this man's words, you know, right from verse 12 up to verse 25, there's only one thing driving him, and that is his passion that the gospel should be preached. I mean, why? You know, I, was, I was looking at this, I was meditating on this uh, passage the other day, and I was asking myself, Lord, what drove him? I mean, he was so passionate. How did he get that way? I mean, what is the key? to being that passionate for the for the gospel where when you're actually seeing people who are preaching for all the wrong reasons even that is okay you're like you know okay fine no problem let them preach for the wrong reasons you know god will judge them when the time comes but actually the gospel is getting preached and people are getting to know how lord what caused this man to have such a 
amazing passion for you and for the word of god and you know for the gospel and um, you know i was just reflecting on that and uh, there are a couple of verses that i would like to share you know in this context because it kind of um, helps us understand the heart of this paul and maybe we too could you know choose to have that kind of a heart uh, so with that idea you know uh, if we could look at uh, romans chapter 1 verses 14 to 15 romans 1 14 to 15 hey are any students watching yeah go ahead For in Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires. Romans one, uh, no, no. Sorry, guys. <laughs> ah, Romans one. Romans one, fourteen to fifteen. Okay. I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to foolish. So I am eager to preach the gospel to you, also who are in Rome. Yeah, question? yeah. so over here or the, the niv which you know asha read out says that i am obligated or i am under obligation to preach to you greeks uh, the literal word is used in the nkjv where it says i am a debtor both to greeks and to barbarians he says i am in debt you know when a person is in debt and they're desperately trying to repay the debt uh, you know it's like a huge debt a lot of money has to be repaid uh do you understand the desperation that there is you know that person is like constantly thinking every day okay uh today what can i do you know to to repay the amount uh how much can i handle uh you know so constantly they are like driven by this um this debtedness which they have and here paul is talking about himself in that way he says i am a debtor both to greeks and to barbarians and so i am more than willing to come to rome and you know share the gospel with even you people uh, because i am driven by this huge debt which i need to repay is what he says and yeah you know just to kind of clarify when it says greek and barbarians you know the term barbarian sounds like such a rough and rude word uh, that's because it's talking about people who are uncivilized you know that's the term that is used uh, so that's basically how the greeks looked at other people okay it's not that paul is regarding people as barbarians the greeks according to them they were the civilized educated uh, elite and uh, in in their eyes everyone else was a barbarian so you know they are the ones who gave the technical term barbarian to most of the other um, cultures to most of the other people groups you know so um, so he says i i'm ready to preach to the greek community i'm ready ready to teach to all the people who come under the label of barbarians i'm ready to preach here to the people in rome i am doing all this because i am in deep debt and it has to be repaid uh, so what kind of a debt is he talking about you know if we were to go to acts chapter 26 verses 15 to 18 we kind of get an idea of what he is talking about acts 26 verses 15 to 18 please Acts eight twenty six fifteen through eighteen, Pastor. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I said, "Who are you, Lord?" And he uh, and he said, "I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand on your feet, and I, for I have appeared to you for this purpose to make you a minister and a witness, both to, uh, of the things which you have seen and of the things which." I will yet reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you to open their eyes in order to turn to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive the forgiveness of sins and inher- inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Yeah. So, you know. Um, he uh, he asks who are you lord when he first has this encounter with jesus and he doesn't know who it is uh, uh, and uh, then jesus responds saying i am jesus whom you are persecuting and so the one that he had been persecuting the one whose people he had been destroying that one rather than coming to him in judgment coming to him in wrath and you know you know uh, and punishing him for what he had been doing instead 
this Jesus says to him, you know what, I'm going to appoint you as, uh, you know, uh, my servant and my witness to go out and uh, share the gospel with these people. And uh, you will be able to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light. So something that was very precious to the heart of Jesus, he chose to place it in the hands of a man who had been working against him, who had been persecuting him. So rather than you know, unleash anger and wrath upon Paul, God instead chooses to place in his hands something that is very, very precious to his heart. And this is something that Paul always remembered and appreciated and was grateful for. So we need to have that same attitude. You know, he felt that he was in deep debt to the Lord. <laughs> the Lord he, uh, whom he had been persecuting, rather than being angry with him, is now placing in his hands something that is so precious to the Lord. And he's saying, I'm trusting you 100%. I know that you will do what I'm asking you to do. So I'm trusting you to go forth and do this wonderful you know, uh, commission that I'm placing in your hands. And so Paul always felt driven you know, uh, to to uh, to do this, uh, to uh, to to somehow. Uh, of course, he can never repay the debt. No one could ever repay the debt, which you know what 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 Christ has done for us. But you know, it was his way of saying, Lord, because you trusted someone like me and chose someone like me for a commission this great, I, Lord, will choose to give my very best, and that just drove him. And so, in in the Philippians passage, he talks about how he is so happy and he is eager to even stay, continue his life here on this earth so that he can be of benefit, greater benefit to more people and all of that. His one single focus is advancing the gospel, you know. So and that's probably why he really enjoyed interacting with the Philippines, because they too had the same heart as him, as him. They too were partnering with him in advancing the uh, gospel. Um, yeah, Shay, if you could uh, yeah, go ahead with your question, please. Thank you, Pastor. Um, it's still on the um, train of what motivated Paul, you know, concerning the spread of the gospel and preaching the gospel. Um, I do understand that God works in diverse ways, but could you just help us explain um, why is it that many people in the likes of Paul, the persecutor, could not have a Damascus experience. Um, probably if Jesus never appeared to him on the way to Damascus, he would have still gone ahead to kill all the Christians. But we see that this encounter was a shift in his life, made him a complete person. Paul became a complete new person. And the energy he used in persecuting the Christians was all converted to the gospel, you know. So my question basically would be is, how do you then explain? And uh, honestly, I'm not of the party that thinks that there are people who are predestined by God. I'm not of that party. I believe very well that God wants everyone saved. But when you read the account of Paul, sometimes you just have to think and think and meditate that God, why is it that, others who were born into another faith entirely why can't they also have this experience how do you explain this to people so that they don't feel like um they're only just specific people god reaches out to and some people maybe they're just damned for life because sometimes people could feel that way when particularly christians you know when they see that even when they're preaching to others they're not even heeding to the and uh, to the word of the gospel how do you then you know create a balance to ensure that people don't think that god is just all out for only favorites or specific people thank you Pastor. yeah it's a good question um you know could i um, answer that after the break uh, because I will look up those verses which talk about how, you know, God reaches out to everyone who seeks him with a sincere heart. So I'll just look up those verses. And uh, so we, we are breaking at 9.55. So which means maybe we could come back and log in at 10.05. All right. So 10.05, if all of us can log in, we'll continue and we'll you know begin by answering this question. Yeah. Thank you. 
Thank you, Pastor.